Good afternoon, everybody. This is Bob Cohen, Vice President of Marketing at Bassware, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, The Future of Accounts Payables Now, Five Ways to Drive Excellence and Increase the Value of Accounts Payable. Um, today's webinar is actually a kind of continuation of a program that um, Levante and CNS Wholesale Grocers have been running for quite some time. Um, what we started out with was Tom Flynn and myself um, have seen each other at numerous analyst events, trade shows, conferences, and what we realized from talking to various analysts and prospects and customers were that people wanted to know really there's a lot of different technology out there, but what does the future of accounts payable look like and how can we effectuate a change? So what we did was we kind of put together a presentation that took all the input from the various analysts, the prospects, the clients that we're doing, and brought up the five different ways we think that you can drive excellence and increase the value of accounts payable. So let's move to the next slide and kind of just do some quick housekeeping here and look at the agenda. So with us today, as I mentioned, is Josh Morrison, who's a Senior Manager of Strategic Sourcing for CNS Wholesale Grocers. For those of you not familiar with it, um, it's almost a $20 billion company and it's one of the largest private organizations in the world. So, um, you know, excellent data from Josh that he'll be sharing throughout the presentation with us. Also with us is Tom Flynn, who has a wealth of experience uh, as Vice President of Sales with Levante. He's held various other roles, account management, uh, product management roles throughout his career, so he knows quite a bit about the AP space having dealt with it. And um, myself, who I talked about a little bit, uh, obviously, you know, I've been in the, the finance accounts payable space and software space for over 20 years now, so a lot of experience talking with prospects, analysts, and understanding kind of, you know, where we are today and where we want to get to in the future. So we're going to take a look at the five ways that we can achieve excellence in AP um, this year, not in the future, but today, because the future is today. Everything that we're talking about today exists today. So we're going to go through the five points that you see here, and then after that, we'll go through the Q&A session. Um, and just a couple housekeeping notes before we begin. Today's webinar is in listen-only mode, so if you do have a question, please use the chat function or question function in GoToMeeting, which can be found in the right toolbar. Um, if we don't have a chance to get to all your questions, we'll follow up with you afterwards. Today's webinar will be a little bit interactive with um, Tom starting off and then Josh and myself kind of interceding um, with various inputs there. It's something that we've done. We most recently did this presentation, the three of us live, at the IOFO annual fusion conference, and we had a crowd of over 100 folks that were there, so it kind of worked quite well, this interaction, so we're trying it the first time live on the web here. But hopefully you'll find it worthwhile. So without further ado, I'd like to move to the next slide and turn it over to Tom Flynn. Tom? Great. Thanks a lot, Bob. And uh, I know we had problems on audio on the last, last uh, webinar. Can you, can you hear me okay where you're at? Yep, you're perfect. Okay. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far, actually. But, but uh, I'll, I'll take it you mean my audio quality. All right, so thanks a lot for that, and then um, I appreciate you kind of uh, uh, turning over and, and giving an intro. Obviously, uh, you and I have been working on this for several years now, talking about how to achieve excellence in accounts payable, what are some of the futuristic things that we see. And then you mentioned something really exciting. A couple months ago, we started uh, getting inputs from some of our end users, and, and Josh kind of became part of the fold here, and he's added significantly to all the different elements we'll be talking about today. So we'll be throwing some of our, our musings and some of our ideas over to Josh to add a little bit more weight to, rather than some service providers coming in and adding, of course, valuable information, but to talk to an end user always adds a lot more, uh, a lot more meat to the bone, as it were. Um, what I want to start talking about today, or talking about in this presentation, is how can you use your data quality to help achieve excellence? Um, I really like to point back to a 10-year look back um, I'm, I'm going to condense it into sort of three waypoints along the 10-year scale here. I guess um, we've been doing this a couple years, so it looks like an 11-year scale, a 12-year scale now. But I like to look back and start to see um, the trends that we're seeing in the master data management space and how that rolls up to supplier data management. Um, I look back to 2001 where I found this really interesting landmark study of sorts from the research, um, excuse me, from the Data Warehouse Institute where they were starting to go out to businesses all over a billion dollars. Um, this was a North American study. And they were looking at, um, or excuse me, it was a United States study. They were looking at the cost of bad data throughout the enterprise. And they were able to quantify in that study, among many other things, that companies, or all companies on the whole, 
we're losing $600 billion a year from poor data quality. So if you took the birth of companies across the U.S. at the time, it was such a costly thing, this poor data, that people didn't really have their arms around, that it was costing upwards of several hundred billion dollars a year for, for U.S. businesses. What was shocking about that was when presented with this information, 50% of respondents had no plan to implement any data quality improvement. So let's kind of put that on the shelf for 2001. Um, there's several different waypoints along the way, 2002, 3, 4, 5, but we're going to get to here to 2006 where industry analysts really started diving into the problem. And there are, it, there's a lot of stuff you can look at for master data management, MDM, and if you're so interested, I would say take a, a self-guided tour on your favorite web search engine about um, the different analysts and what they were saying uh, in the 2004, 5, and 6 time frame. I pulled out some information from this Gartner report where they really started to say that organizations were beginning to realize that data quality was a critical business issue. And I've absolutely heard that echoed in the last five and six years just from the market, from the AP space, from the P2P space of people saying, well, we, we, have, we have a lot of issues sort of in our data quality. We're really up against it because that data begins to decay as soon as we put it into our system. We set up a supplier, and then it's immediately at risk for something changing on the supplier's end. So how do we create a methodology to, to fix that? And that's what the analyst report is saying. Learning the methodology that fixes that will, will have a huge value benefit to your organization. So moving along to 2009, um, the Chartered Quality Institute found a whole host of stats. Now, I'm going to spare you guys reading the stats that you can see on the right side of the page, but I do want to highlight a couple of them. Um, we'll start with the last, the last bullet point in that box all the way to the right, where now you're looking at 17% of companies having no plan to initiate a solution. Um, juxtapose that to 2001, where 50% of companies really didn't have a plan. So you can see that migration, that mindset, and these are like-sized companies. The only difference is they're all companies over a billion dollars. The only difference is the 2009 study brings in UK and US companies. The 2001 company, oh, excuse me, the 2001 study really focuses on the US. But you can see where there is a, a vast improvement. What's shocking about this is that of the companies surveyed, only 4% rated their data quality as excellent. So that's, that's something when you consider that we all want to do excellent things in business. Our aim is to become excellent but if, the, if only 4% of us um, feel like we're excellent, then 96% of us are going to have a very difficult time to get to excellence if the data populating our systems isn't really matching. What was interesting about those studies is that they all focus on the corporation or the enterprise. One thing we need to do kind of as a community is start quantifying how does this information or data quality affect the P2P process specifically for our own careers. So I, I point to this 2011 uh, survey and study by Spend Matters. Uh, you can find the survey on spendmatters.com. I recommend reading some of the work from Jason Bush. He's the analyst with Azul Partners and, and runs spendmatters.com himself. And he really got into this survey about the dirty secret of dirty data and how do you start quantifying the cost of dirty data in your P2P organization. Um, that's, that's a very important study. I think it starts to start putting a price tag on what data costs people on a daily basis in the P2P suite. And we took note of that at Levante for sure. I actually have a colleague of mine in the organization, and she travels with her own report about the costs of poor data quality in the P2P organization. Um, obviously, this, this has a, a lot to say. This is a whole hour presentation in and of itself. I've reduced it down to one slide. But it gets into how do you identify gaps and convert them into costs so you can start quantifying what poor data costs you. Now, the top bullet is some, some obvious stuff we can all get our minds around. The time spent uh, entering multiple vendors or chasing down um, duplicate checks, et cetera, et cetera. But then as you get into the second and third bullet, you start to get into some slightly more sophisticated stuff. Um, I, I can read the words on the page here, but one of the things we can do is take advantage of Josh being a functional expert in this space. He's, he's on the call with us, on the webinar with us. Josh. Prior to the webinar, we talked a little bit about some drill down information about compliance with controls and fraud and, and communication between groups. Can you add a little bit about this? Yeah, sure I can. Thanks, Tom. Uh, it really all boils down to the old adage, garbage in, garbage out. And, and that's something that, that I try to keep in, in my pocket all the time. I know that if we put the time up front to make sure that the, the information in the system and the data and the assumptions that we're, we're driving our business based on uh, is, is accurate, thorough, and complete, 
then we can not only make good decisions, but we can actually drive change and affect the change in the areas that we expect to see. Um, if we don't have good data quality and we don't have good controls uh, up front, uh, then, then we're running the risk not only of losing money, um, but losing our competitive edge within the industry and our ability um, you know, as payables to be able to support the organization, uh, whether it be in the organization's growth or, or quality initiatives. Um, so when I first heard the discussion <coughs> um, with your luncheon and that I attended with the, uh, the quality of data discussion, uh, it, it was absolutely near and dear and, and absolutely right on point. So any of those companies that still might fall into that 17 percent uh, or whatever that number might have dropped to now, um, if they don't get on board quickly, they might find themselves out of business. Yeah, and, and Josh, that's not to say that um, 17 percent uh, haven't figured it out and, and the balance has figured it out. It just means that the balance um, that, that's pursuing this, the 83 percent, um, they're, they're in pursuit. They're creating a plan and moving forward. Um, another another uh, concept that, that we talked about a little, and Josh, I'm going to let you kind of riff on this because I think, I think you have a lot more tactical and practical experience with, with this kind of stuff. This is just a simple, simple example that we've pulled um, just out of some raw data from our, from our app, which speaks to there's a lot of complicated ways where your poor data is costing you. A lot of complicated ways, but it's, it doesn't need to get that complicated. There's also a lot of very simple ways where poor data costs you on a daily basis. And I know, Josh, you have some thoughts about what's on the screen now. Yeah, and this is another one of those slides that we can really spend a lot of time just drilling into to the implications on what this one shot is telling us. But from a very top level, um, you know, I, I, my, my, the majority of my career was spent in accounts payable where we oversaw our vendor master uh, and post audit and compliance. And when I look at this slide, the very first thing that jumps out to me, uh, number one, is that we've got some fraud issues here. There could, it could, it could be possible that, uh, you know, there are folks working for the same company that might be setting up a, a, a fraudulent remittance address. And without proper controls in place, there, you have the potential of, of sending out money to the wrong party. Um, the other thing that this really speaks to, uh, if you're looking at the A&W as a supplier, uh, you've got the $1.7 million in spend for, for the vendor setup A and just over a million dollars in spend for that second setup. Um, without a good solid system in place, uh, for example, a PO requisition or a P2P system, um, there are very little controls to guarantee that that million dollars doesn't somehow roll up into that 1.7. Um, and for, for those of you who do work with post-audit um, or even an internal audit recovery process, you know the easiest way to spend money out the door that shouldn't go is by, by paying an invoice twice. Um, it's also one of the easiest controls to implement to be able to fix your system. Um, so having good data and also having good reports, uh, again, this is, this is, as you said, Tom, a screenshot of your system, but any type of tool that you can avail to yourself and your company uh, that provides these types of exceptions uh, is, is really tremendous. Uh, and the same is true down with Allied. Allied Waste is, is, is one of those types of companies that um, you know, has different uh, uh, business entities that may have a parent company that, that rolls up. Uh, it may or may not be a shared service. So it's important to understand also the parent-child relationship for your suppliers. Um, one, so you understand how to segregate your spend and are not misdirecting funds. <clears throat> but also, too, as you start to strategically look at your AP spend base, you need to be able to understand um, who, who you're paying and, and what you're paying for. Um, so again, you know, th this type of information to go back and, and true up the data that you have in the system uh, is absolutely vital. Thanks for that, Josh. And I think, I mean, it just goes to something as simple as a naming convention. Being able to identify that find out if there's any errors that were caused from it, and then shoring up your naming convention on an ongoing basis. That's, that's such a simple part of the everyday basics of, of the role, and, and it's such a, you know, potentially a silent killer, too. If that's happening there in the simple areas, imagine what's happening in the complicated areas. And that's, and that's why the, uh, the achieving the excellence in data quality is so paramount. And, and it's an uphill battle, too. I mean, it, it's really hard to keep visibility on all different facets of data quality but there's a lot of good stuff waiting for you at the end of it if you, if you do keep your, uh, your attention on the data quality. Yeah. So moving, and, and moving Tom, on. 
Yeah, go ahead. I would, I would, I would just only add one other uh, piece of information to that is we as uh, process and business owners in the accounts payable area, we can drive compliance with uh, control policy and documents. And we can assure that as these vendors are being set up, using something as simple as a naming convention or a TIN match, um, we, can ver we can assure the quality up front to make sure that we're not going back to have to do a, a data scrub down the road. Yeah, and I, I love where you're going with that, Josh, because you know we're, we're not spending an hour on the, although we're spending quite a bit of time, we're not spending an hour on the first bullet, but, but you, you could. I mean, there's, there's, you, we're just talking about identifying it, quantifying it, figuring out how important it is, and letting the, you know, the audience decide how important it is to them, but getting into what's next, how do you solve it, how do you fix it, what fixes are, are currently in place, that's what gets really exciting about this, because you can see a tangible and, and a, um, um, a monetary benefit as a result of doing things that curtail um, any any data decay. So so uh, yeah, that gets to be very exciting. But obviously, I don't think you know we're not going to have time to run down all these uh, paths. But of course, that that is uh, that's an interesting area to to get into. Um, with with all, with all that in mind. Um, Data quality becomes important, but, but it moves into a, a, a different but related concept here on the screen, the, the concept of the supplier network and the portal adding strategic value. Now, we don't have the benefit of being in, in the room right now. We, we, typically, we do this as our, our luncheon or our seminar, or we do it at trade shows. And this, everybody on the phone, this, this starts the interactive portion, typically. People start talking about networks and portals, what they've seen, what is it, what isn't it. and so. We're, we're probably a little bit uh, a handicapped not being able to have a group discussion about this, but, but let's, let's see what we can get through here. But, you know, obviously, everybody's on the life cycle in terms of their exploration of what a portal could do for them, what a vendor portal could do for them. There's some folks who've only heard the word a thousand times and aren't really exploring it, and they think, what's a vendor portal? If I make a more socialized system so I can communicate with vendors a little bit more quickly, why would I want to do that? If I put my information up on a cloud, is that safe? Is it dangerous? And then there's folks who are exploring different opportunities. And then there's folks who are experts in the space and they successfully use portals. You know, it's important to, to define it a bit, to talk about are you using a cloud-based system? Is it a private portal? Or excuse me, is it a private cloud? Is it a public cloud? Um, would IT want to get involved if your information is up on a cloud or in a SaaS-based system? Um, getting role-based permission into the network. Giving suppliers the opportunity to get into the network too. What, what does that mean, um, and, and how would that improve business? Um, th this is an interesting concept because the network um, uh, or the portal approach really gives you an opportunity to achieve that data excellence. We talked about in the last section achieving data excellence and that only 4% of people thought they had data excellence. What a portal enables you to do in any form or any facet that you heard about it, it enables suppliers to become part of the ongoing dialogue. And if you get them to be part of the ongoing dialogue, you'll have their most up-to-date and most refreshed information. And that's paramount to running your business successfully. If suppliers are constantly pinging you and updating information and communicating with you, you're, not, you're no longer relying on information that you set up in a system a week, a month, a year, or several years ago. You're now exchanging in a dialogue with them. And a portal, not, not all portals, always facilitate this kind of conversation, but at least they have the opportunity and they have the desire to put suppliers sort of on that equal footing of a communication strategy. Um, you, you'll have to evaluate what, how a portal works for you. We can entertain some questions, as Bob mentioned, at the end of this dialogue, um, or you know, we can obviously take emails afterward and talk about what some sex, successful portals are. And, and Bob will go into that in his next section about how portals really helped the AP automation and the buyer-supplier relationship. So that's kind of what I want to say at a high level. I'm going to show just just a couple, uh, you know, quick screenshot. This is actually, this is weird to look at it. This is our old Levante app. I'm just going to show something very quickly from a high level. We have a whole host of clients, and sometimes they get stuck. They ask us to communicate with a supplier on their behalf. So they'll say, hey, Levante, can you communicate with these suppliers? We take their information, and it's a dead-end road. We can't communicate with their suppliers. Maybe we have a Dropbox, maybe it's a remit to address. Whatever it is, it doesn't get us any communication. But if you have a network that you're working in, or the supplier has a portal to, to self-assess and self-divulge information, you can then leverage the network information, the cross-section of information, and find out, well, even if one client doesn't have all the right information to facilitate proper communication, several other clients will. 
Now, of course, you get into a ton of privacy issues and is the information protected, and all roads lead to yes on that. Everyone's going to uh, abide by all sorts of privacy issues and in protecting data. Assuming all those controls are in place, you have such an advantage by using a network or a portal to communicate more quickly with any population that it, it really is undeniable. And this screen is intended just to sort of illustrate that. I have prepared a quick view. We're just going to spend one second on this. A quick view. The, the, the punchline into this is this is a quasi-case study. It is about Levante, but just use this as a surrogate for any automation system you're using right now, anything at all. Just think about what's key on your mind. Uh, do you want to do uh, a T&E system? Do you want to do an ERP system? Whatever, auto maybe it's AP automation. If you're reaching out to do some type of automation system, you have to populate it with data. If you're going to use the data that's been existing in your um, population of data now, if it's supplier data, if it's employee data, whatever it is, to import that simply into your new automation it is good. It's, it's constructive. It's kind of it speaks to what your environment is now. But to be able to import new and refreshed data, either through a portal where suppliers and employees can put new data in, or through a network where you can import it from logic sharing from a much larger network population, that gets you off to a running start. And, and Bob will talk about this a little bit. Why I bring this up is because we started with a client. Uh, we worked with them for a year. Um, the the punchline is. If you see those bold numbers in the middle, um, where they had very somewhat ragged or very um, underdeveloped supplier data, we were able to use the network to update 76% of their supplier data. And as a result, we were able to communicate in one year with 70% of their suppliers. And where they had previously found, um, I'll just quantify it quickly, $50,000 of opportunity, doing it this way and communicating with suppliers bumped that up to $1.8 million. So, what, what it talks about is if you can communicate with suppliers quickly through a network or through a portal, then you're able to really improve your results. Now, this is a Levante story, but you can think of any story you have. Being able to communicate with the population is going to obviously improve the results and move things on a much faster scale. Yeah. Um, Tom, Tom, I'll just add the one point to that. You're absolutely right. I mean, this, this is really everybody's story. The environment that we're in right now, we're looking at a shrinking global economy. And the, the more that we can collaborate and, and shorten that communication string between suppliers and customers, the more value we can add uh, as an accounts payable house and, and uh, you know, as a, a, a value added partner in that entire process. Yeah, 100%. And, and um, that, that point actually means quite a bit to me, the kind of the way, the way you lay that out, because I think that's an important goal for everyone. It's an achievable goal. That, that value add and it's an it's important goal too. So I, I, I think that's the perfect end note there. Um, with that, um, Bob absolutely uh, um, is, is an expert in the AP automation space. He, he kicked off the presentation today and um, we always like to focus on AP automation because there's such a world of improvement that you can get through the proper automation and, and the proper strategy for automation in the AP space. Um, Bob is very modest with the introduction of himself today, but I, I'd consider him to be certainly, um, you know, uh, one, one of the foremost experts in AP automation, what it does, how you would deploy it sort of on a consulting level. Bob, why don't you take us a little bit uh, through this concept and the, the impact of reducing costs and streamlining processes. Thanks, Tom. Um, tough introduction uh, to follow in there, but I'll do my best. Actually, you know, this is, as we said, this presentation is kind of a, an evolving um, piece of work here. And after the conversation that Tom just had, it, it seems to make sense to me that we almost move bullet number four of the effective collaboration between the buyers and suppliers and finance and AP to number three. So maybe we'll do that in a future one. Uh, but for purpose of this conversation, let's go ahead with um, the AP automation to reduce the cost and streamline the processes. Josh mentioned something that we all know, garbage in, garbage out. You know, if you're going to do AP automation, you need good data. So if your data is clean and um, your vendor master file doesn't have 80% bad data in there and 20% good data in there, um, once you start off with better data, the AP automation project goes that much smoother. Let's take a look a little bit at like, what AT, AP departments looked like in 2011. Scott Pezza was an analyst for Aberdeen Group. Uh, they do an annual study on the AP marketplace here. And we kind of use this as kind of a, you know, kind of a checkpoint here to see where you are. Um, so last year, the study was done, and you can see that fully 77% of the people surveyed still had paper invoices coming in. So almost 
over three quarters of the invoices that are still coming in were paper based. In today's world, you got to scratch your head a little bit and say, with all the e-invoicing and supplier portals that are out there, you wonder why this is going on. So, if your organization, if you're listening there, and your organization has, you know, a lot of paper, you're not alone. You're actually in the majority. But this is something that technology exists, and this is something where it's just a very inefficient process to be processing paper manually. So, let's take a look at the next slide here. Um, some of some of the results here, and kind of how the organization ranked from that same study here. And the other bullet I didn't mention on the previous slide was that fully a third of accounts payable time is spent just handling inquiries. And that's because things aren't online. They're not available. Suppliers and buyers aren't collaborating in an automated fashion. You know, suppliers call up saying, hey, where's my payment? And they make that call to usually the person that they know. And then that person calls the AP department. The AP department then kind of trying to track down that invoice, what's the payment status of that, and then gets back to the business unit person who called them, and they call the supplier back, or the supplier calls there, whatever it is. The studies I've seen you know, in the last seven, eight years all say the same thing. About a third of the time in manual AP departments is spent just chasing down um, answers to questions for payments. So it's really rather inefficient. So here we look at the same study, as I mentioned, and we're looking at the top 20%, middle and uh, bottom 30%, of companies and how they're doing processing. So look at the top here. Those companies that have automated out all the manual processes, are working with supplier networks here, have e-invoicing in place, take just under four days to process a single invoice. And the cost of that is just over $3. If you look at the bottom of the slide here, the laggards, they're taking 21 days to process it. And it costs them 13 times more money to process a, a single invoice than it does for somebody who's in the best in class. You know, whether you're processing 5,000 invoices a year, 50,000 or 500,000, when you start using numbers, you know, where we're taking $35 difference between an invoice to process from leaders to laggards there, you can do the math and we start talking real money real quick. So there are significant savings that can be achieved as well as the many other tangential benefits that come along with the automation. So let's go to the next slide here and take a look, you know, kind of, do the builds here. What does AP look like today before automation? If you're chasing paper, you know, we mentioned before a third of the time is spent just chasing down paper. The invoices, where are we there? You're an invoice processor, paper comes in many often or very often, it's late, it's missing information, you have to get the data on it. So really you're just being an inquiry detective in AP right now. You're being reactive. Things are showing up, you're gonna have to process them. They're late, they're missing information, you have to track it down. Very reactive process. But when you automate, you go from reactive to proactive, and you add much more value to the organization. So that time that you're spent before chasing down invoices and being that inquiry detective, now you become a strategist. How can we save the company money? You can take over some of these roles saying, well, are there discounts available to us if we pay early? Are we getting everything negotiated, the right kind of discounts for all the volume that we have? Did we negotiate a contract for 1,000 widgets and we ended up buying 10,000 widgets, well, we really should get discounts for that. But if you're chasing your tail around just chasing down where an invoice is, there's no time to do that. But once it's automated, now you've freed up yourself time to become much more of an intelligence officer rather than one who's just chasing information all around. You become much more productive. You can become an in income producer, change that view of the organization of AP, which is really just someone who processes paper. And we all know that AP does a whole lot more than just process paper. You know, now you can become much more valuable to the organization post-automation. Let's take a, a look at a, a client that we had, and this is the actual um, example of a client that we had. And before they, let's move, let's move on to the next slide here. And before uh, they automated, they did a calculation and determined that it was costing them $55 per invoice to process that and get it paid. Everything was being done manually. It was paper-based invoicing being received into the mailroom, opening them up, typing it into the system. Everything was, all the orders were paper-based. There was no purchasing system involved. And kind of as we go up the staircase here, uh, through the levels of automation, they added various pieces of AP and P2P automation to the mix here. And as you can see, I'm not going to go through each of these steps here, but as they added each of the different technologies that were in place, you know, whether it was in-house scanning, e-invoicing, uh, automatic PO matching, three-way, four-way matching, and the like, they went from $55 in invoice down to $4. So once again, back to the example I made before, if you're processing 10,000 invoices a year, and I know most of you on the phone here are probably doing a whole lot more than that, you know, if you're saving over $50 per invoice, you know, 50 times 10, uh, or excuse me, 50, you know, 
uh, yeah, 50 times 10, you know, is quite a significant amount of money there. So there's real money being made here. So it's not just um, the benefit we're getting from automation. There's real tangible ROI when you're implementing a system such as this. Yeah, and Bob, was, if I can just if I can just add uh, first, I do love this slide. The first time I saw it, it really spoke volumes to me. I just want to add that the first point is these are suggested points for automation. Folks in AP know that there are many multiple options that we can engage in to try to automate and streamline our process. These are just some of the biggest examples and the biggest areas of impact. But anything that you can do to begin to automate and streamline leveraging technologies that exist will help you drive down costs uh, and also help you to be able to scale your business to support growth and, and uh, decrease your costs across the board. Perfect, Josh. Yep, thanks um, for that. Yeah, there is. There are many ways to automate, and you know, whenever we go into a client engagement, you know, we're not presumptuous. We don't assume to know uh, what's best. We talk to the client to see what their problems are, you know, what they want to achieve tomorrow, and what the future looks like. Uh, you know, too often we get clients who come to us and say, "I need to eliminate the paper. That's my one goal. The paper is is killing us." And that's just the beginning, the on-ramp to automation. So that's a means to an end. So now that we've eliminated the paper with that client, we want to take them further and say, OK, now imagine a world where there's no paper in your uh, AP department. It's all electronic. Now let's take a look at what functionality, what you want to provide to the business, what value you can add to that. So Josh, it's, a, you know, it's an excellent point that you make there. You know, there's many ways to success. Uh, people often ask us, you know, what do you do first? Do you automate AP? Do you clean up your data? Do you do e-invoicing? And, you know, we take a look at each client individually and see what makes most sense. You know, we all have our um, ideas on which we should do first. And, you know, obviously if you have bad data, you know, if you automate a bad process, then, you know, all you've done is speed up a bottleneck. We don't want to do that. So you need to get better data coming in is, is my personal view. And then figure out, okay, if the processes are in place, even, you know, then we can get that invoice in and we can route it around appropriately and do as much automated as possible and then we can worry about the receipt of those invoices. So, you know, lots of different ways to uh, accomplish the automation. So great point, Josh. Now, um, let's move to the next slide here, which is the next bullet, which is talking about uh, effective collaboration between suppliers and buyers here. And this is something that's, you know, Josh is, uh, <clears throat> it's great to have him on the line. As Tom said, Josh actually attended one of our seminars, one of the earlier ones that we did on the future of AP, and he kind of came up to us afterward and said, you know what, I uh, couldn't agree with you more. I'd love to be part of this. And so he's kind of adding kind of the value uh, to what we say to, you know, kind of adding credibility to here. But, you know, a good example, we did one of these seminars in Dallas, and there was, um, a person in the audience who talked about some of the implications of not having buyers and suppliers collaborating. So in AP, they received an invoice from a certain supplier, and there was a two net 10 discount available to them, and they took that regardless of whether or not it was within that 10-day time period. Well, they thought you know they were being pretty slick and getting ahead of the game, but they weren't talking to the purchasing side of the fence in their own company, and you know, one day they, they did talk to the purchasing department and they found out that the supplier was actually adding 2% back to the cost of all their goods because finance was taking a discount that it didn't earn. They didn't want to lose money on it. Their margins were slim enough. So by not communicating between finance internally and uh, procurement, they were actually thought they were getting ahead of the game, but all they were doing was getting back to ground zero. So they are taking a discount and the supplier was adding it right back in. So it's a great simple example of how you know you think your you know suppliers aren't going to be on to you. Well, if you're taking a discount that you're not earning, the supplier is going to know, and they're going to bake that cost back in, uh, either telling you about it that hey you're taking a discount you haven't earned, or they're just going to bake it into the cost of that good. So you know just kind of a simple example to talk about one of the implications of you know internally suppliers, excuse me, procurement and finance AP talking to one another. Let's go to the next slide here and talk a little about the disconnects that exist. Um, when companies don't communicate with with one another here, so this slide is just tend, is intended to kind of show what each one of these different factions, what their kind of missions and goals are. If you look at AP, right? We all know most of the folks on the phone are in AP or have some uh, linkage to AP here. You know, they focus on the control and the compliance of the processing of those invoices. They're focused on error and dispute management. However, their goals may be, you know slightly or entirely different than the other folks here. So look at Treasury. What's Treasury concerned with? Obviously managing and optimizing cash and cash flow. Um, if AP and Treasury aren't even on the same page, then you know there's a disconnect that's there. If we take a look at the suppliers, 
you know, suppliers, you know, we talked a little about the economy and kind of the state that we're in, you know, so suppliers are squeezed even more. So suppliers have their issues, and if you're squeezing them too much, you're going to put them out of business, and then what's going to happen there is that you're going to be without a supplier that you need, and you'll have to source another one, and that's not a good issue. IT is obviously balancing their issues. You know, today, many applications are going to the cloud, you know, SaaS-based organizations, but many organizations are, are still looking at on-premise, so IT is focused on that. So just kind of this, this slide kind of wants you to think about when you're looking at automating and moving into the future here, we have to, a lot of different constituents that are here, we have to take them all into account here, you know, whether it's cost-based, cash-based, uh, risk-based, visibility, whatever it may be, each constituency has different interests that need to be considered before you um, do things in you know, kind of in a vacuum there. So let's look at the next slide here. So here's some of the challenges um, that everyone faces here. I talked about, you know, things being in a vacuum here. Suppliers, you know, if we start out on the left side here, you know, some of their challenges are really bad visibility to um, kind of demand and what's going on. Orders come in, they don't know about them, um, you know, and that kind of impacts them. They get an order for 500,000 widgets. How are we going to fulfill that order? Um, you know, if they had visibility and had connection between the buyers and suppliers and the buyers actually gave them a heads up and said, hey, you know what, we're thinking about doing this, can you do this for us? It would give them much more visibility. They'd like that visibility and that would kind of eliminate some of the challenges here. Um, you know, within an organization, we all want to optimize cash flow within the organization. You know, Treasury doesn't want to make more money available to finance to pay bills than it has to and yet if you don't have any visibility into your liabilities because all your invoices are being received you know after the fact then you need to keep a slush on the money just to pay the invoices that come in because uh, you have no visibility but if you're capturing all the information up front and you know what your liabilities are so we know that you know all the invoices we receive for the next 30 days we know that um, you know, next Friday we're going to need two hundred thousand dollars. The Monday after that we need a million dollars. You know, Treasury can plan for this, and they can maximize the return, the internal rate of return on that money that they have available. So, kind of take a look at this slide uh, in its entirety here, and just you know, keep this in mind when you're when you're planning out your organization here, and, and look at the different challenges that everyone faces here. Let's look at the next slide quickly here. So <clears throat> we talked about some of the challenges and problems that go on, but here's some of the benefits that exist when buyers and suppliers collaborate with one another. I talked about the improved visibility um, that buyers have, better control over the whole entire process, lower handling costs, lower invoicing costs here uh, from the buyer's side, you know, improved cash flow. We talked about all of these, a better audit trail. Now you know exactly what's going on. You can view the entire process and know if there was a problem somewhere, where it occurred, and how you can remedy that going forward. Uh, you can also eliminate that maverick buying where people just pick up a phone and call something and an invoice arrives, you know, you can minimize that to a great extent. And that way everyone's buying on, you know, on negotiated contracts and, you know, getting better deals that have been negotiated and rather than spending more money and costing the organization more money. On the supplier side here, um, the improved collaboration results in, you know, uh, better day, day sales outstanding, things get paid faster, they have reduced processing costs because now they're submitting things electronically, uh, et cetera. So there's a lot of benefits from suppliers and buyers um, communicating, and this is just kind of an example of a few of those. So let's take a look at the next slide here. So, you know, in a nutshell, how can buyers and suppliers collaborate better with better connectivity and better data, better data optimization? We kind of talked about this all throughout the, the presentation here, so I won't belabor this point here, but we need better lines of communication. We have to talk not only internally, but also to our suppliers outside the organization. They have to be part of this network we talked a little bit up front, Tom did, about what is a network, you know, and a network is anybody talking to one another, whether it's internal network, external network, but we need these networks to be open. Let's move to the next slide. So kind of in the sake of time here, um, you know, this is kind of kind of mapped out, you know, some of the, of the ways that you can improve connectivity and the data within the organization here. So, you know, from the data receipt, uh, when something comes in, all the way through uh, analyzing it after it's been going through here and some of the processes. So this is you know, kind of an example um, showing various areas that we can improve when we're doing this um, data improvement and improved connectivity. Let's go to the next slide. So with that, we'd like to bring Josh on, as we mentioned. Uh, this is the part that we kind of added to the presentation, and Josh kind of you know 
puts the, the rubber to the road, as it were, and kind of you know, talks in reality about you know, how you can use metrics to measure everything that we talked about here. So Josh, I'd like to bring you on board. Sure. Thanks, Bob. Um, so yeah, I mean, just taking a half a step back, when I first came in and, and saw this presentation at the Lunch and Learn, I believe, earlier this spring, um, it, it really struck me all of the great information and suggestions that were being put out. Uh, but the one piece that I, I felt was missing um, is the validation and the verification process to make sure that uh, the steps that you're putting in place and, and you know, the value that you believe you're adding by doing that is actually being realized. And the way that you go down and, and realize uh, uh, you know, the value is by putting together uh, some intelligent metrics, uh, performing some benchmarking, and, and, and uh, making sure you have good performance metrics to be able to, to look at. So if we move on to the next slide, we'll take a look at um, exactly you know, really what metrics can do to you. Um, and, and keep in mind, this is very top level. It's intended to get your thought juices flowing. If you're not looking at metrics now, um, this is to get you thinking about how you can use metrics in the future to drive and to manage your business uh, and also to help you as decision makers uh, figure out what the right direction is for your business. Um, so again, I, I'm not going to read down every bullet here, but you want to make sure that the metrics that you're looking at, um, that you can measure your, your data um, not only accurately but consistently. Um, as, a, as a business owner, I know one of the biggest challenges that we've always had um, is not only getting at the data to be able to report on, but making sure that we're consistent in how we do it. If we report data differently than we did, uh, say, uh, the last time we reported this last quarter, um, you're, you're talking apples and oranges. And if you're doing that, you're, you're never going to gain traction. You're never going to be able to obtain that baseline that you're going to base all of your other assumptions on. Um, and, and you're basically going to have a moving target while you're treading water to try to achieve it. Um, so that consistency piece is really huge. Um, you know, metrics are used to make sure not only to, to, to show where we've been, but to be able to show what it is that we do for the organization. Um, you know, as a longtime accounts payable person, um, one of the things I used to really, uh, you know, used to get under my skin is, is hearing that, you know, we are a support group. And for anybody who knows payables well enough, we do much more than just support the business. We, we drive change, um, we drive quality, and we drive those relationships with our suppliers. So being able to quantify that and demonstrate that to senior management and also business partners is, is a tremendous value add. Um, there is an alignment factor. We talked in the previous bullets about being able to collaborate between buyers and suppliers. Um, the collaboration with finance as well. Uh, is absolutely huge. Um, everybody, if everyone has the same understanding for what the story is, everyone can understand where we've been and, and where we're looking to go. Again, that's driving better decisions and making better process uh, uh, changes. Um, you know, when you're probably all uh, familiar with the, the term uh, defining SMART goals. Uh, we want to look at specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely goals, uh, making sure that we're not just saying something like, gross sales or decreased cost. Um, we want to be very specific and, and we want to identify exactly what it is that we want to do. Uh, so again, when the rubber meets the road, we, we know exactly what direction we're moving. Um, you know, and when you, when you identify those goals uh, and you start to measure your progress in reaching those goals, it helps you stay on track um, and, and it keeps us from, from uh, getting sidetracked on, on other projects that uh, are maybe less value added. Um, it also helps us uh, reach our targeted dates. So when we're talking about that, that uh, you know, all-encompassing, you know, that triple constraint, that cost, that time, that scope. Uh, when when we have these goals defined, uh, it, it paints a roadmap for us, and that keeps us going in the right direction uh, and in a timely fashion. Um, and and you know, it helps us answer certain questions. So once we have decent metrics in place, we can answer how much do we need to increase headcount when we increase our business? Um, you know, how many new offices do we need to open if uh, you know, the following factors take place? Um, and it answers that more important question, which really underlines everything that we do, why? What's in it for me? What's in it for our stakeholders in the business? Um, why do we do what we do, and how do we make it better? Uh, moving on to the next slide. 
So again, this is this is a suggestion. Um, I have seen metrics put together uh, multiple different ways, and it really is a bit of an art form. Um, so my suggestion to you is that that these are uh, triggers to help you getting uh, going in the right direction. Uh, but developing metrics are personal to the organization and to the management team of the organization, depending on the industry, your business, and, and what your goals are. Um, I, I do like to include some quotes. I let them speak for themselves, but this one is, is a great one. You get what you measure. If you measure the wrong thing, you get the wrong behaviors, and, and that's absolutely true. Um, so you have to you have to ask yourself uh, for your company: Do you want to measure your throughput, your productivity? Do you want to look at your you know effectiveness and quality? That speaks to error rates, rework rates, downtime. Um, you know, efficiency could speak to how much overtime we're putting in. Are we putting through more transactions per hour, per FTE, um, per unit, whatever that baseline is, which we'll get into in just another minute. Um, service levels are huge for folks who work with SLAs. You understand that the ability to go back and evidence um, our uh, um, actualized work against the, the, the stated SLA agreement uh, components um, sometimes is a make or break when it comes to being able to renew those when that contract comes up. Um, so I would suggest, like with any initiative, when you're setting up metrics, benchmarking, or scorecarding, the majority of the time that you put into doing this is upfront, laying out your assumptions, deciding with your management team and decision makers what is it we're looking to track. Um, a, a very quick anecdote um, just just based in my experience um, you know we had a bit of a moving target and when we first started doing this in, in at CNS in our organization um, there wasn't really a defined process owner uh, and we struggled trying to decipher what it was we were looking to report what was meaningful to the business and unfortunately what that led us to was a considerable amount of rework um, what I like to call good practice because we put a lot of time into it that didn't really go where we wanted it to go. Um, but had we really taken the time to understand our stakeholders and our management team and the organization's goals, um, it really would have made all the difference. So take the time to put that amount of discussion in and, and, and get that all documented. Make sure you have process owners that buy into this without the buy-in from the folks that are that you're really reporting these numbers to again it's going to be meaningless um, the only caveat I would add to that is that any type of metric should be designed both to satisfy a top-down view as well as a bottom-up view uh, so your your CFO might need to really understand what those top-level numbers look like and what those trends look like from the top-down view but these metrics are also designed to help uh, business process owners uh, become more intelligent about their own jobs and what they're doing, um, and that's that's the the bottom up approach. So it's it's really a, a two prong uh, benefit. Uh, the next slide brings us into <clears throat> finding that baseline. And again, these these are some suggestions. These are some of the the more common baselines that I've seen used in the industry. Uh, you know, for accounts payable metrics. Um, Find a common denominator. Always compare whatever it is that drives your business. Find that one component. Is it your head count? Is it your FTE units per hour? Do you have per transactions? Are we going to baseline every number that we have against the number of invoices that we put through in a week, a month, or a year? Um, are we going to have it based on dollars? Um, a lot of companies will do metrics based on sales dollars. Of course, for the accounts payable side of the house, it could be uh, disbursement dollars, uh, spend dollars. Uh, it could be liability outstanding. Um, you know, it could be cost of goods sold. So anything, again, that's meaningful to your business, decide what it is that you're going to baseline um, as your common denominator, and then take every other component that you're tracking um, as a function of that. And, and what that'll do is it'll draw a line in the sand, and if we start ben, uh, performing benchmarking or metrics today, a year from now, we'll, we'll have established some historical trending, and we can make assumptions based on that common denominator and that common baseline um, because our assumptions move with our business. 
and if our cost of goods sold moves, then uh, you know our metrics move with it. Um, then, uh, you know, with that common denominator, you have to really think about well, what is it that we really want to look at? What are we tracking? So some of those really uh, the most common uh, and and widely adopted measures um, for AP metrics is of course days payable outstanding. Uh, DPO, that's probably near and dear to most everybody's heart that's on the call. Um, you've also got the flip side of that is days uh, sale outstanding. So that's receivable days. Um, keeping in mind that our counterparts in the industry are credit managers and receivable managers, and that's something that, that's uh, very important to them as well. Um, and of course, if you bring that up to the level of the CFO, the DPO and the DSO are direct feeders uh, and components into the company's cash conversion cycle and its ability to generate and maintain working capital to be able to support the ongoing cost of doing business. Um, so again, some other key metrics that are here, uh, you know, productivity and trending and forecasting, again, that's looking forward and looking back. Um, when you establish good history, you can see good trends, but you can also make great assumptions for forecasting. Um, and help to drive where you think the business is going. Um, error and exception handling is huge. For a company like CNS Wholesale Grocers, we put through uh, you know, well over, I believe it's about 2 million transactions annually. Um, when you have a 1% error rate against 2 million transactions uh, times X number of dollars per FTE hour, um, you start to see some, some exponentially growing figures and it gets very expensive. So error and exception handling um, is one of the biggest areas that metrics are used for. And that is really also, that's looking at it from the bottom up view as we're running our department, making sure that if there's red flags that, that jump up, we need to know that. Um, a very quick story, uh, anecdote to back that up and, and, and you know, understand we're, we're getting tight on time. Um, but using our metrics, we actually had identified by looking at the different buckets of liability, um, we discovered a, uh, a system issue um, that uh, erroneously created transactions and duplicated liabilities in some of our systems um, that caused us to identify a multi-million dollar error in our liability and inventory. Luckily, with these metrics, we were able to catch that and correct it before it ended up being coming spend that went out the door that was potentially not recoverable. Um, so it's empowering, um, and it, it really puts the reins of control back into the accounts payable manager's hands. Okay, uh, Jumping forward to scorecards here. Um, a scorecard, again, um, is, is just what you make it, just as uh, however you define it. What you've got here is the uh, uh, DMAIC uh, you know, uh, image, which for those of you familiar with the Six Sigma, um, this is really the standard here. Um, but if we, if we can define what it is we're looking to do, we can measure it, we can analyze it, we can improve it, and then we can control it. So we can state our objectives, so we can measure our objectives, figure out what our targets are once we understand how to measure that. Then we say this is our current state, and in order to get to what our target is and bridge the gap from our current state, these are the initiatives we're taking to get there. Um, now this can be done on a simple scorecard. It could be done on a balanced scorecard if you're trying to do some more robust uh, things. Um, the, the bottom line here is to be able to take these key performance indicators and these objectives that we've identified and be able to present them and track and report them in a concise and summarized fashion uh, for AP management and also for senior management. Okay, moving along. Um, I think that brings me to the close of, of metrics and I guess the only other final piece I would say is that when we're talking automation, we're talking supplier networks, portals, collaboration, data cleansing, um, you know, again, it, it's all great in practice, but unless we can prove the worth and the value of what we're doing uh, by applying metrics to it, um, we're, we're kind of just floating in outer space. So this, this helps keep us tethered um, and, and relevant. So thank you. Great. Thanks, Josh. So now we're on to the question section of the webinar. Um, I know we presented a, a lot of information here today. Um, and you know, <clears throat> what our intent was is really to kind of give you kind of, kind of a, a roadmap, an idea, you know, different points that you need to be looking at if you haven't automated, if you've done a piece of it, you know, other things that you should be looking into that are, you know, definitely available and things that you should be looking at as you move forward. So with that, let's try to get to the question section here. 
Uh, once again, if you have a question, please use the question function in GoToMeeting, which can be on, found on the right-hand side. Um, so let me bring back on Josh and Tom. You guys here? Yeah, we're with you. Yes. Great. Um, <clears throat> I guess the first question is, um, if we're a small organization, can we still apply the principles you discussed? I, I, I think so. I, I think that the principles, absolutely. Can you cleanse your data 100%? Can you better collaborate with your suppliers and your customers and your internal stakeholders? Absolutely. Um, you know, there are certain things that may not make sense, and, and what and the, what I would put out there is uh, if you're looking to the service provider, um, you know, market, uh, you've got some great folks like Levante and Bassware that are in that space. But if you are a smaller company, uh, you know, it might not make sense. And, and, and these guys would probably tell you that it's, you know, it's probably too robust of a solution. Um, I would, again, just uh, stress that these are best practice concepts. Um, when I first came in, this title, the, the, the presentation was called The Future of AP. Um, but the future, again, is really now. So look at this, however big or small, and figure out how you can, you can take these uh, efficiencies and make them your own. And I would, I would echo, Josh, what you said. I think your knee jerk on that was in terms of data quality and in terms of collaborating better with buyers and suppliers, et cetera. That's probably the place to start functionally. And it can get frustrating if you have service providers who say, hey, we do this, this, and this, but we only work in this end of the market. And then as the question indicated, hey, I'm a small company. Can I still do this? There's a lot of good consultants, a lot of great information online, different chat groups. And uh, I know IFO, um, IOFM, and there's a lot of different. Uh, TAPAN has great information online. There's a lot of, and, and forgive me for missing any anyone that, that you um, might uh, subscribe to. But starting there with, Consulting your peers on data solutions and collaboration solutions will will really get you uh, what your appetite for making more efficient processes. Yeah, Tom said if you're looking for data, there's plenty of it that's out there. You just have to don't get into analysis paralysis. You know, just keep looking at the data. At some point, you have to draw a line on the sand and say, okay, we're going to move forward. You know, kind of a little contrary to what Josh said. You know, that we do have solutions and that are for for very small organizations that are out there. You know, if they're, you know, if you're processing a couple thousand invoices a year, we have solutions for that, invoicing solutions, invoice automation solutions, as well as those that have multinational organizations dealing with multiple currencies, multiple uh, ERP systems, multiple languages, and the solutions kind of scale for that. But, you know, kind of the same principles apply. You know, whether you're processing 100 invoices or you're processing 100,000 invoices, you need to have the processes in place, kind of the roadmap that we kind of talked about here today. Um, next question that we have here is, and Josh, I know maybe you're best suited for answering this, at least first. Is, you know, the person says, you know, we have difficulty getting our vendors to comply with what we want. You know, is there a best way or suggestion for how we get our vendors engaged and onboarded? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I guess I would first say it depends on what you're trying to get your vendors to do. Um, I would always approach any situation uh, that includes uh, external stakeholders by, by performing a real simple stakeholder analysis. And, and that's really getting an understanding of what's in it for them. And unless we can prove to our suppliers what's in it for them, we're never going to get their buy-in. Um, so if we can do that effectively and we can identify uh, what it is that, we, that they will get out of it, we'll have a win-win situation and, and, and we'll have good collaboration. Hey, uh, Bob, I would add to that. Uh, well, first, let me tack on to your previous response, which was, yeah, I know that both your firm, uh, Bassware and Levante, both do, do have products that scale all into the market. So to the previous question, never count yourself out. Always always explore the service provider solutions. Um, I think that's, that's kind of an important thing. And then on the same concept of getting suppliers to, to engage, that is, that's a commitment, and that, that really rolls up into everything we talked about. Um, the purpose of automation or a network or um, improving data really rolls up into finding a solution, not just on a project basis to get suppliers to communicate one time because there's one question or one burning issue that you have to talk to them about this year, but committing to data to a, maybe a network or portal solution or committing to um, more collaboration. That 
solves the problem on an ongoing basis year after year. So you're not just solving it for whatever the burning platform is now. You now have a process you, process you can rely on ongoing. Um, it, it, re, regarding that, if, if there's any questions offline, that, that is part of a Levante suite, so I'm, I'm happy to talk a little bit about that offline. Um, but, but I do think it's a commitment to a process rather than just scratching one inch. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to scratch just one inch. Make sure we get them all. Uh, next question, we'll make this the last two because I think we've reached the top of the hour. I want to be cognizant and respectful of everyone's time here. So um, the last question is kind of directed towards you, Josh. It said, you know, how did you get, um, and I'm going to reading into this, it sounds like they've had some difficulty internally with just communication. So they said, you know, how did you get sourcing and finance to collaborate better at CNS? Yeah, you know, that's an excellent question. That's a relatively new um, uh, thing that's happening here with CNS and, and what the answer there is get the buy-in at the top level. Get a seat at the table. Um, you know, you have to be able to get that buy-in. If, if we're trying to drive change, um, you know, from, from the middle of the organization chart, it's really, really difficult to drive the business upwards and downwards to, to where we want it to go. Um, however, again, if we go and we understand what's in it for our senior management, and we can provide to them the value proposition um, that will help get their buy-in. And if we have their buy-in and there's collaboration at the top level, um, that will trickle down and that will push down to all the business units that, that report up to them. Um, so, so absolutely make sure that your top-level stakeholders uh, uh, have complete support of your project. <laughs> well, well said, Josh. You hit the two major points, which is, What's in it for them, which is just the guiding principle probably of all facets of life, but what, what's in it for them? Quantifying it. We've talked about quantifying a lot today, but where's the dollars and cents of it? And that will get people's attention. That will get people to buy in. You got it. Great. Well, on behalf of everybody um, listening in and uh, Josh and Tom, I wanted to thank everyone for taking some time out of your day. We hope you found this worthwhile and informative. I know we had a lot of information to cover in a relatively short period of time. You know, typically we do this over a couple of hours, but we have a number of requests to, to make a webinar to this, and so hopefully you found it worthwhile, a little bit of thought provoking. Uh, we do these around the country from time to time, so be on the look at that, uh, look out for those invitations if you're interested in attending. And our contact information is on the screen if you want any more information on any of the points that we discussed today or any of the solutions that were um, alluded to. By all means, uh, shoot us an email or give us a call. Uh, our information can be found on the screen and on the website that's there. So I'd like to thank everyone once again for spending some time with us. We hope you found this worthwhile. On behalf of Josh Morrison and Tom Flynn, I want to wish everybody a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.